Okay, so I hope you can see the slide on irreversible reactions in series. So in here, we'll just limit our irreversible reaction in series into a two-step reaction. Okay, so we have here the intermediate R being formed, but we are interested in the final product S from a single uh, reacting species that is being converted, and that is our A. So we are given a single species in here in which uh, we are to produce the final product S. Now, as you can see there, there are, uh, there's an equation underneath the stoichiometric uh, equation that is provided. And you could see here the rate equation is first order with respect to A. So when you are given a series reaction, just like the parallel reaction, you are to treat the steps in here, though we don't have steps in your parallel reaction. In here, you have the steps. So you are to treat the steps in here as um, elementary reactions. Okay. Now, in the first step, you are forming R from A. So if we're going to write the rate equation on the first step, you will have negative DCA DT equal to K sub 1 C sub A. If you're going to process this using separation of variables, this would be your corresponding formula, or this would be the corresponding equation after you already have done or have finished the integration process. Now, if we will simplify this further, this very important formula, C sub A <clears throat> equal to CAOE raised to negative K sub 1 T allows you to determine the remaining <clears throat> remaining amount of A after some type T. Of course, the problem has to give you the initial concentration of A and the rate constant for the first step reaction. Okay, so you have that. Now, in some problems class, in some problems, this K sub 1 and this K sub 2 are equal. So if that is the case, I'm already emphasizing it now in here. The formulas that are given you will not work anymore except for this one. The, for the formula for the first step and the formula for determining the amount of A remaining after some time. Uh, I'm speaking of a series reaction in which the rate constants of the first and the second reactions are equal. So if they're not equal, then all the formulas that you have here will be applicable. Now, one thing that you still need to take note of is that in the formula that will be given to you initially, there's no R and S present. So we only have the uh, reactant A initially present. We don't have R and we don't have S. Okay, should there be R and S, then of course we need to account for their presence in uh, uh, in a scenario where, in, let's say, for example, you would be asked how much of R is present after some time T or how much of S is present after some time T. So you have to take note of the initial amounts of R and S because in this case here, you don't have R and S present initially. Now, this is the first formula that will help you determine the concentration of A after some time T. Now, let's look look into another formula, this time a formula that will allow you to determine the R, the intermediate R after some time T. So since R is present in the first step and in the second step, and in the first step it is a product, now we, we can write the rate of reaction of R um, looking at it as a product. So we write it as positive DCRDT. And since it's the product, so we write here equal to K sub 1 C sub A based in here. So it's still K sub 1 C sub A because us, R is being formed from that. And then R is being used in the second step. You can see here that it's being used. So you have to account it in here. So minus K sub 2 C sub R. It's now minus because your R is not being formed in the second step. It's being used. So it's K sub 1. C sub R. Now, if you look intently, class, in this original date expression, you have C sub R as your unknown function. 
So it's okay if you transfer this term in here on the left side because they have C sub R. However, this C sub A class will not be processed because it would be your third variable already in your DE. So you have to change it to an expression that you already determined in here from the first step. So you have to express your C sub A as a function of the initial concentration and the rate constant of the first step. And that's what is done in here. That way, looking at this particular equation, you can have it evaluated using the linear differential equation approach. So this is your unknown function. And this is its derivative comparable to dy dx. This is your k sub 2 c sub r. So this is your p of x. Your p of x is your k sub 2 and this is your y. The entire expression here on the right is your q of x. That is if you can still recall your uh, linear d then. So if you're going to look at the form here and compare to the form of the linear d e, it would be something like this in terms of the general form. Your y here is c sub r and your x here is t. So it's already linear here. It's linear in the unknown function c sub r and the independent variable t. So if you're going to process this using the things that you have learned in DE, you will have to determine the integrating factor. That one I will not anymore show here because you know that already. You're supposed to know that. But if you're going to have this evaluated using the linear DE approach, this will be the final formula that you will be getting. The formula allows you to solve for the intermediate R at any time T as long as the initial concentration and the rate constants of the first and the second reactions are provided. So anyways, the CAO, just like the K sub 1 and the K sub 2 are all constants. So if the time is given to determine the uh, concentration of intermediate R, you can readily have it solved using this formula. But where this formula came from, it came from the evaluation of this first order differential equation. Now, if the scenario arises, why am I keep on emphasizing this? Because it's a given problem in the chapter, in chapter three of Levin's field. If a, a, scenario, a scenario arises wherein your rate constants are equal, then you are to derive your own formula in here. So that is why you need to recall how to process a linear differential equation. That way, you will not only get used to this particular scenario. What if the conditions are not the same as this one? So you won't know anymore to uh, derive your given formula. So in here, you have already the formula. If we have the scenario that k sub 1 and k sub 2 are not equal. Okay? Any questions so far in here? So in here, you already determined the formula to use in determining C sub A, given the time and the initial concentration of A and the intermediate R, C sub R. But we're not to stop in here because actually our final goal is to determine the concentration of the final product S. Okay, So we cannot find the concentration of the final product S unless we know this too. So that is why... The formula in determining C sub A and C sub R at any time T is being introduced. Okay, so how do we determine the C sub S? Now, oh sorry. Your C sub S could be written in this form in terms of its rate uh, equation. It's the second step that has the S, the final product S. So, when you write its rate equation, then it would only be dependent on that particular step. So it's k sub 2, c sub r. You notice in here that your unknown function is different than your uh, variable on the right side. So if you intend to really evaluate this differential equation and find the value of c sub, r, c sub s given the time, you are to express the c sub r here as a function of c sub s or as a function of c sub a o. Okay? You change the c sub r as a function of c sub s or c sub a o. 
Now, there is an alternative formula though that would be much more easier to follow and understand than this DE. Although if you would like to determine C sub S from this DE, you'll be still getting the same answer. Now, what is that particular formula? That formula I'm mentioning is this one. Noting that there is no change in the total number of moles. So there will be no changes in the initial concentration of A and the final concentration of A plus the concentration of R plus the concentration of S. Meaning, since R and S all came from A, then the final concentration of these three after some time T should be equal to CAO. Now, if there is a scenario wherein your C sub R and your C sub S are not equal to zero, then you have to add it in here on the left side. So you have CAO plus CRO plus CSO equal to CA plus CR plus CS. Why? Because of this. There is going to be no change in the number of moles in your system at any particular time. Now, how will this particular formula simplify the procedure that you are seeing in here, in which you are to look for an expression uh, for C sub R that will be dependent only on C sub S and constants that I have mentioned. So CAO, K sub 1, and K sub 2. Now, in here, you already have the value because it's given by the problem. It's impossible that the problem will not give the initial concentration of A. Now, given the formula for CA, which is CAO, A raised to negative K sub 1 T, and given the formula for C sub R, we got here on the previous slide, let me just uh, erase. So this is the C sub R formula. You're going to plug in the C sub A and C sub R formula in here. And you're going to subtract it from CAO. Then you have the formula for C sub S. That will allow you by just uh, using subtraction that will allow you to determine the amount of S after some time. If you do that, this is the simplified form of the formula. You substituted the, substituted the CA formula, CAO, E raised to K sub 1 T, and uh, you have substituted also the C sub R. So the remaining is the C sub S. And that formula is this one. So you have now three formulas to follow. CA, C sub R, and C sub S. All will allow you to solve for the amounts of A, R, and S respectively given the time, given the initial concentration of A, and given the rate constants. Okay? Now, however, class, there are uh, problems related to uh, serious reactions that uh, requires you to apply maxima minima or optimization. So an example is only applied to this scenario. A scenario wherein you don't have initial amounts of R and S and you don't and K sub 1 and K sub 2 are not equal. Now what are those? Uh, special cases which is required by some problems. Now it's already pre-derived for you so you can go directly to the formula as long as it's applicable to the scenario that is given. Now before I go to the formula, it's stated here that if k sub 2 is much larger than k sub 1, it's referring to this equation class. If k sub 2 is much larger than k sub 1, you will have a pseudo first order reaction. It's as if the second step does not affect the rate of formation of the final product because it's very big in terms of rate. Why is it very big or large in terms of rate? Because your K sub 2 is a lot larger than K sub 1. If you're going to look at the formula in here, if this one is larger and this one is very small, it's just like this has no effect on this. It's just like you have this one. So it will just cancel this and this, leaving you a negative because this one is negative, E raised to minus K sub 1 T. If K sub 2 is a lot larger than this, K sub 1, you will have a very small value divided by a very big value. 
this tells you that more or less the second term is zero. A very small value k sub 1 divided by a very big value k sub 2 will be a very small value. So it does not have any effect on this 1 minus this expression here. So I'm showing to you the simplified form of this formula for C sub S whenever the second reaction is a lot faster than the first or K sub 2 is a lot bigger than the first. So if K2 is much larger than K sub 1, this is now the simplified formula for C sub S. Okay, I've shown to you in the previous slide how, is, how did it became like that. Now rate is determined by K sub 1 and that's the first step of the two-step reaction. We go back to the fu uh, fundamental primary principle and that is the rate determining step in any mechanism of reaction or in any series of steps is always the slowest of all the steps. It determines the rate of the entire reaction because it is the slowest of all the steps. So just like this one in here. So the other step, which is a lot faster than this one, is not anymore being considered. So the rate of formation of the final product S is dependent only in the slowest step, which is the first step. Why? Because of this. K sub 2 is much larger than K sub 1. If we interchange it, if K sub 1 is much larger than K sub 2, meaning it's the second step that is the slowest, the rate of formation of the final product S will now be dependent on that particular step. Again, go back here and do your mathematics the way we did it for the first scenario. Okay, reaction is governed in this case by K sub 2, the slower of the two-step reaction. So these are just scenarios which are only, of course, applicable for the conditions stated. You cannot simplify the formula that is provided to you for C sub S unless it conforms to the conditions that are given in here. Okay? Now, going back to what I have mentioned a while ago regarding cases of, optim uh, of optimization for series reaction. Now, optimization always again goes back to the fundamentals of how we optimize things. We go back to your uh, differential calculus and use maxima minima to find the corresponding amount of a thing dependent on a particular variable when it is either minimum or maximum. Now, the formulas are already pre-derived in the textbook. I will not go, or go into the differentiation or go into the evaluation, but I leave that to you as your exercise and how these particular formulas came about. But if you are asked what is the time when the intermediate R is maximum, the time is only dependent on the rate constants. So the final formula is the inverse actually or the reciprocal of the loop mean of the rate constants. We have it here. So you only need to know the K sub 1 and the K sub 2. Now at that particular time when R is maximum, you would also be asked, a follow-up question like what would be the maximum concentration of R? Then again, the formula is dependent only to constants. You see here K sub 1 and K sub 2. And you see here also initial concentration. If the problem has equal rate constants, you, have, you are to derive your own formula for this two because it has a different formula. So that is why I'm, I'm asking you to study on your own how these particular formulas came about using the principle of maxima minima. That way, if you have this condition, you would know your formula as well to use. Okay, so you have this. You may wonder why, what's the significance of having to determine when will R be maximum? And what is that particular maximum concentration of the intermediate R? Why do we need to determine when R is maximum? It has, uh, it has a very important role in determining when is the rate of the formation of the final product R, rather, final product S is maximum. When is the rate of formation of the final product S maximum? You need this. Okay? And I will point out to you 
the principle behind why you need this information and why you need to know how these formulas came about. So it's in here on the generalizations regarding the irreversible reaction in series, specifically a two-step two reaction in series. Now, A decreases exponentially here. You could see that A decreases exponentially. Why? Because of this. There is an exponential decay in the value of A. Okay, we go back to the formula. R rises to a maximum and then falls. So there will be a time wherein R will be maximum. We have already did, uh, shown to you the formula. I've shown already the formula to you a few seconds ago. The time when R is maximum and what is its corresponding value based on the formula. And however, it does not stay there. Your R will eventually be used up as more S is being formed. So it falls. It reaches a maximum value, then it falls while S is expected to continually increase in value. Why? Because it's the final product. Okay, we expect that its value will just uh, stop to increase when there's no more intermediate R being formed. Now we go to the second thought in here, or second generalization. The greatest increase in S is observed when R is maximum. So as to the question, what is the essence of the formulas that were shown to you a while ago, this is the reason. The greatest rate of increase in the formation of the final product S will happen when R is maximum. And you have to determine the time when this R is maximum. R is our intermediate. Now, K sub 1 and K sub 2 can be evaluated or known by noting the maximum concentration of the intermediate and the time when this concentration is reached. This is the second significance of the two formula that was shown to you. Using the two formulas shown to you in the previous slide, we can, you can solve two equations simultaneously. Two equations with two unknowns will lead you to the unknowns. For example, if the unknowns are K sub 1 and K sub 2, then you can solve it based on the two formulas that were shown. What are those formulas? These are the formulas. So if the time of when R is maximum is given, you have one equation with two unknowns. And if the concentration of R is given with the initial concentration of A, you have another equation which has K sub 1 and K sub 2. So two equations to unknowns will lead you to the unknowns. That is the K sub 1 and the K sub 2. In cases where these are your unknowns, if these are not your unknowns, then you don't use these two equations simultaneously. Okay? Do you have any questions so far for irreversible reactions in series? Okay, so there's none, so I'll proceed. So we're done with irreversible reactions. So as a review, we have discussed parallel or competing reactions. We have discussed homogeneous catalyzed reactions. We have discussed autocatalytic reactions. And this is the last one. We have discussed the uh, two-step irreversible reaction in series. This is added to the other uh, equations that were shown to you for first order, second order, third order, and zero order irreversible reactions. Okay? Now we go to reactions that are reversible. So it's, uh, we're already done with irreversible reaction to we go to reversible reactions. So when do we say that reactions are reversible? Okay. So many reactions are reversible due to the fact that no reaction ever goes to completion. In reality, no reaction ever goes to completion because of the fact that there is a certain degree of reversibility to all these reactions. We just write them as irreversible because one particular direction really dominates another or it's really very large compared to another. And as such, we say that it is already irreversible. But all reactions, this is even written in the book by Brown and Lime, General College Chemistry, the fundamentals their kinetics is being discussed. All reactions are generally reversible. 
they have a certain degree of reversibility. Now, the irreversibility increases as the equilibrium constant increases. Now, uh, in here, we write our equilibrium constant as A sub C. If the manner of determining this equilibrium constants are based on concentrations. Now, in some other books, it's written as K sub EQ. So, the subscript here is not C, but EQ. Again, we use the C because we're using concentration, concentrations in determining the equilibrium constant. Now, in gaseous reactions class, wherein you're not given concentrations, but you are given in your concentration partial pressure, then we change, we change the subscript here C to P. It's now K sub P, not K sub C. Why? Because the manner of determining the equilibrium constant is not based on concentration. Now it's based on partial pressures. Okay? Now let's proceed to actually there are only two reversible reactions that are included in here. Because if it's already third order, the complexity is already too much. Uh, can you give me a few minutes, class? Huh? Just a minute. I have to turn off the electric fan because it's really getting cold. Now, I have here the first order reversible reaction. First order in the sense that we have a unimolecular reaction in A and it's forming a single product R. So it's a first order reversible reaction. Now, M here. If you recall in our previous discussion on integral analysis, represents the ratio of the initial concentration of the product R and the reactant A. Now, when we write our rate equation here for this reversible reaction, it's as if we're going to write this into two separate reactions. Uh, the way we do it when we prove the correlation between mechanism and provided rate equation or implied rate equation. So this is what it, I mean. So let's say you have K sub 1 and you have K sub 2 for the rate constants of the forward and the reverse reaction respectively. So I write now this reversible reaction into two irreversible reactions, separate irreversible reactions. So A forming R with rate constant K sub 1 and R forming A with rate constant K sub 2. Now, when you write the rate equation, whether you express it in terms of product R, <clears throat> just like in here, or you express it in terms of the reactant A, now this one could be written as this. It was already shown to you. You consider these two reactions. So in the first reaction, A is being consumed. So we write K sub 1, C sub A because it's being uh, consumed and you have your written negative. Now your C sub R on the other, rather in the second reaction, your A is not being consumed, but it's being produced. So the manner of writing, its rate expression will now be dependent on reactant R, which is the product of the first. So when you write the rate equation, that should be K sub 2, C sub R. This is the net rate equation based either on A or based on R. Do you follow? So when you write the net rate equation for a reversible reaction, you are to write it into two separate irreversible reactions. And this is how you do it. So first step is K sub 1, C sub A. And second step is K sub 2, C sub R. So minus because A is not anymore being consumed in the first, in the second rather here, but that rather it's being formed. 
Now, you can write this C sub A here as this one. You know this already from the formula CAO times the quantity 1 minus XA. So, you know that already. And for this one in here, you express your C sub R in terms of CAO. How do you express CAR or rather CR in terms of CAO? Very simple. So you write CR is equal to CRO 1 plus XR. Well, you will ask Miss Ali, why is it plus? Because generally class, we look at this as just one reaction wherein you have a pointing arrow to the R. Where R is written on the product side and A is written on the reactant side. So we view R as a product, even though we look at it this way, two separate reactions. Okay? So now if R is a product by virtue of its location, it's on the right side, then the concentration of R at any time T would be the initial concentration of R times 1 plus XR. It's plus here because it's product. Now, if I will distribute, you will have CRO plus CRO XR. Now, you don't have any problem with CRO because it's a constant. It won't be any problem to you if you're going to evaluate this DE when you have a CRO. But you have a problem with this. What is this? This is the amount of R that has been formed. Well, this one is the initial amount of R. So you have to express it in terms of A because you cannot process it using this one here. Okay, so how do you express it in terms of A? So you go back again to the fundamental relationship that I have shown to you. CAOXA is CROXR over 1. Why is it 1, Miss Ali? We have here 1 and this is understood to be 1. I'm talking about their coefficients. So CAOXA is equal to CROXR. So you can replace the CROXR here to CAOXA. So what will happen now? Your C sub R is equal to CRO plus CAOXA. Then you won't have any problem because if you cut here, Your unknown function is already XA. And you don't have any problem with XA because you have XA here. And your, your CRO and CAO are all constants except the XA here. And you have also XA here. Okay? So you may wonder then, why do you have the MCAO here, Miss Ali? Where did you get that one? From here. Isn't here CRO is equal to MCAO? So this is the one. By the way, I'm not the author of this. It's Levin Spear. So I'm just teaching you how this particular expression came about. So your CRO from here is changed to MCAO from here. And your CROXR was changed to CAOXA. Now, if you have this as your right side coming from these two original terms in here equated to this, then you should know how to evaluate the DE already. Since you know already how to evaluate the DE then when you were in, uh, what was that, first year or second year. So you use the techniques that were discussed to you in DE on how to evaluate this particular rate expression. Why am I teaching you how to evaluate? Because you need not memorize any formula if you know how to evaluate the DE. So what particular formula will you have to zero in or really take note of? It is this formula. And it is to be equated to CAO, BXA over BT. Because this, this replaces this one. This replaces this. All right? If you look at the DE, your unknown function is XA, your independent variable is T. Then that's up to you on how to evaluate the DE. Okay? Because DE is not anymore being covered in here. It's already your tool now on how to evaluate this expression. I will clear my markings. Do you have any question? Now, if you will proceed, 
this will be the final equation that was already derived for you. Where is it? Now, here it is. You have here a, a DE which has conversion at any particular time and XAE here is the equilibrium con conversion. Okay, equilibrium conversion. Now, where is this particular equilibrium conversion taken from? It's taken from this formula in here on top. Okay, the equilibrium constant is equal to the ratio of the forward to the reverse reaction rate constants. This was discussed as early as Chem 1. Okay, when you are given a reversible reaction. This was also, I think, discussed in PCAP. Okay, now you can also determine the equilibrium constant. If this is not given to you, I'm referring to the rate constants. You can also base it on the concentration at equilibrium, not any concentration. The concentration at, at equilibrium of the product divided by the reactant. Now, in the case of the uh, first order reversible reaction, your product and your reactant has one for their coefficients. So it's understood that these concentrations are raised to one. If you have a case wherein the coefficient of the product is two, for example, and the coefficient of the product uh, of the reactant is three, then this becomes two plus and this becomes three. I hope you, rec you can record that one. Your equilibrium constant is equal to the uh, ratio of the equilibrium concentrations of the product raised to their stoichiometric coefficient in the provided uh, chemical reaction to that of the reactant raised to their stoichiometric coefficients as well. So that is why I wrote here two and three. What if you have something like this? Let's say you have that. How will you write the equilibrium constant? Let's say I'll place here three. So this particular reaction does not fall on first order reversible nor second order reversible because it's not. So how would you process or how will you determine the equilibrium constant for this reversible reaction? Equilibrium constant is equal to product, so you have CCE squared times CDE. You multiply the products, you raise them to the coefficients of, the, of these products in the chemical reaction provided. The denominator will constitute also of the concentration of the uh, reactants. So this will be now raised to 3, and that one is CBE raised to 1. You get it? I hope you have, this was discussed to you before because it should be discussed in Chem 1 and in, if not in Chem 1, in FICEM. So this is writing generally the equilibrium constant for a reversible reaction that is based on the provided stoichiometric equation. Okay, this one is easy, I will clear my markings class, because we have a single reaction only and a single rather a uh, first order reaction not a single reaction one and one in here so writing the equilibrium constant is as easy as this okay now how did this become okay, m plus xae over one minus xae now it will go back again to the fundamental cro one plus you don't write XR, you write XRE, meaning the degree of conversion of R at equilibrium. Okay, the, I'm writing for that one. Now we say that we have CRO plus CRO XRE. Initial concentration. Concentration of R formed at equilibrium. Why you see here an M and why you see here an XAE? 
meaning this particular expression again class should be expressed in terms of CAO XAE. Why? Because you see here an XAE. For now, you have this formula to use, but it's important that you understand how this particular formula came about. That way, when it's time for you to write down your own expression for the equilibrium constant, you know how to simplify it just like the way this was simplified. Okay, so this is the formula provided for the equilibrium constant for a first order reversible reaction. If we will simplify the, or we will evaluate now the DE here, this will be your final formula. So you have several options. It's either this one paired to this, sorry, or this one paired to this. So the left side could be an LN in terms of conversion, or it could be an LN in terms of concentration. The right side remains as an expression in terms of conversion. So it depends on uh, what information is provided to you by the problem. But these are all equal as written. This is only applicable for first order reversible reactions, meaning other stoichiometric equations. If I place here a 2, it's not anymore applicable. Nor if I place something like this, it's not anymore applicable. So the importance of having to know how the formula came about is very important. So the formula given to you is only applicable to this scenario that I have shown to you. Okay? So that's it. And here we'll continue. So note all first order irreversible reactions are simply special cases of reversible reactions in which. So take note, your first order irreversible reaction is just a special case of a first order reversible reaction where the equilibrium concentration of A is equal to zero or the equilibrium conversion of A is equal to one or so all of these are acceptable. The equilibrium constant is infinity. Actually, this one is only copied from here because if this is infinity, K sub C, this is infinity already if CAE is zero. Place your CAE zero, this would be now infinity. If this is one, this will also be division by zero and you will have an equilibrium constant which is infinity. What does this imply? if your equilibrium constant is infinity, meaning one direction, the forward direction, dominates in terms of speed the reverse reaction. So it's just like the reverse reaction is not anymore occurring. Or if it is occurring, its, its rate is really insignificant compared to the rate of the forward reaction. So that is why it's written here. That your first order reversible, irreversible reaction is a special case of a first order reversible where the equilibrium concentration of A is zero and XAE is equal to one. This one only follows after this two. Okay? Now I'd like to end with the second order reversible. That way tomorrow we can have sample problems and go to differential analysis. So we have here second order reversible reactions. So look at it. Two species left and right, two moles here, two moles here, two moles here, two moles here. Okay. Either which you look at it, the left side and the right side has a total of two moles of either reactants or products. The formula that is given here, and here is applicable for this scenario. Okay, what is that scenario? Initial concentration of A and B are equal. So if you have A and B here, or if you have two species present initially, their concentrations initially should be equal. And this is very important. Very important. If this is important, this is also very important. There are no initial amounts of R and S present. 
So R and S are all zero in terms of initial concentration. If this particular condition holds, this is your formula. This is your formula for a second order reversible reaction falling into any of these forms here that is written. If it's not second order, then it does not conform to any of the forms that is written here. Okay? Meaning it is non-elementary if we're going to base it on the stoichiometry. The same principle holds when we talk about the first order reversible reaction. Okay? So this is it. And if you don't have any questions, you have any questions? Mm -hmm. This will be our sample problem tomorrow. After that, we can go to differential analysis and then that caps already everything that you need to know regarding uh, differential and integral analysis applied to constant volume systems. Then we go to variable volume reactions. This one is short compared to the constant volume in terms of the context of the uh, in terms of the volume of the topic here this is just like probably around 25 percent compared to constant volume so this is just short just in time for us to cover everything before your exams on march 14 so we will continue this tomorrow but before that do you have any questions <laughs>